Good morning. I'm Aline Gatignon. I'm here with Luke Disney, who's the executive director of the North Star Alliance, working out of Utrecht in the Netherlands and doing fantastic work of setting up and managing health clinics to address uh, uh, mobile populations who are at risk of HIV and AIDS across Africa. Good morning, Luke. Hi, Aline. Nice to be here. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. Thanks. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work that uh, North Star is doing? Sure. So North Star Alliance was set up in 2006 by the United Nations World Food Program uh, with support from TNT Express, a uh, express delivery transport company. And the issue really um, they focused on was the fact that HIV at that point, so we're talking sort of the middle, beginning 2000s, middle 2000s, was having a devastating impact on supply chains in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. So from the, H, from the World Food Program's perspective, this was really about their humanitarian supply chain. So we're, they were trying to get food from ports out to hungry communities. And in particular, in sort of 2003, 2004, they were responding to a crisis in southeastern Africa. And they noticed that they couldn't find enough trucks to move the food from the ports out to the communities. And this was strange to them because normally they're pretty well prepared for crisis situations in these vulnerable areas. And so they've got a list of all the transport companies. They've made estimates on the capacity. But what they hadn't calculated into their model was the impact of HIV, which was, you know, on the rampage at that point um, in this part of the world. So they were losing truck drivers or the local companies who they rely on were losing truck drivers at an enormous rate. And that, as a result, was affecting their ability to deliver food. At the same time, so the flip side of the coin was when they did analysis into the situation, um, they also discovered that the very supply chains they were setting up, and you've got to think of sort of long supply chains, hundreds of trucks in some cases going into areas for periods that can be up to two years in the case of a protracted relief and recovery operation, were also a factor in spreading HIV. So you have these communities isolated, relatively isolated communities, which all of a sudden have this huge influx of truck drivers coming in. And at that point, they started, they got very concerned, not only because of their own supply chain risks, but of, of course, the ethical implications of doing, trying to do good, and at the same time, inadvertently uh, bringing harm to some of these communities. So they, um, I, I remember the first time that I was in Africa um, in an isolated community when I actually met somebody who had full-blown HIV. Um, it was a truck driver uh, named Edward, and he was lying in on his back in a hut in the middle of nowhere, literally, and you, you were just thinking to yourself, how in God's name did HIV get to this place? And, and the fact that he was a truck driver is probably how he contracted it and sadly brought it back to his village where he infected other people. So that was WFP's part of the story. TNT Express at that point um, was busy uh, expanding in sub-Saharan Africa and of course as an express delivery company also very reliant on the transport sector as a backbone to move packages, in this case, commercial goods for, around. So together they got, they were, uh, they had already started working together on, on improving logistics of food delivery and they then turned their attention to this issue. And really um, coming at it from a logistics perspective, as opposed to from a traditional public health perspective, they started to say, right, well, where, what's the problem here? And the problem is in Sub-Saharan Africa and other places that you get, truck drivers spend an enormous amount of time away from home um, in Africa. They're on the road. Uh, long distance truck drivers can be away easily for up to 22, 26 days a month, you know, on these long areas, spending an enormous amount of time at truck stops, which are isolated, uh, parked on the side of the road, where they interact with um, women who have been forced into sex work because of the lack of other economic opportunities. And, and really just a lot of the time, women who have no other way of making their, their living and feeding their families. So you get these hot spots growing up, what we call disease hotspots, going around these truck stops, border crossings, ports. And this is where you get high risk groups like sex workers interacting with what we call bridge groups, truck drivers, who then take the disease, HIV in this case, back to their, their families. So, and it's not just diseases like HIV. We also see, for example, in the recent Ebola crisis mm -hmm. in West Africa, that mobile populations, again, play an enormous role in spreading the disease from one place to the next. So that's, that's how the whole thing got started. And, and the philosophy was, well, if it's happening at these hot spots, then the traditional health infrastructure of hospitals and high dense, highly dense uh, populations in cities and towns is not going to work. We need to get the facilities or the services out to the people in these areas to prevent 
uh, the disease from being transferred in the first place. So we started by setting up small container-based clinics. We used shipping containers because they're cheap and easy to manufacture to move around and also to control the quality. Uh, and if you're inside one, it looks like a doctor's office that you and I would see here. You know, we kit them all out. They've got airco, they've got water, uh, lights, electricity, of course. And we started putting down these containers with nurse-run uh, teams of with outreach workers at the uh, different hotspots, and then building networks of them along the transport corridor so as drivers move from one place to the next and sex workers who are also mobile, we could start to build a continuity of care and, and get into these hotspots uh, where the actual transmission was happening. So we started that in 2006, 2007. North Star Alliance was created as an independent organization to take this forward because obviously TNT and WFB had other things to do with their time. And, and since then, North Star has grown now uh, almost 10 years later into an organization. We've got uh, 35 clinics uh, in 13 different countries at the moment. Uh, we've served over a million people. Uh, we've actually helped establish uh, 50 different clinics in Africa and transferred some of those to governments, others to other local um, partners. And the networks continue to grow and expand. So that's in a short, perhaps not so short, <laughs> <laughs> explanation of who we are and what we've done. So I remember um, back last May, I was visiting one of your clinics in South Africa, and I actually um, met a commercial sex worker who was at the clinics. Uh, her, her name was Michelle, and she was saying that, you know, she was telling me about the huge difference that the clinic had made in her life, and uh, she was saying that she wanted to become, you know, her ambition was to become kind of the, the president of the sex workers. And so, you know, this really made me think that you're, you're basically giving a voice to populations who don't have one in these areas. And um, so I was wondering if you could maybe tell Tell me a little bit more about how the work that you're doing is moving from a sort of top-down approach towards healthcare to maybe a more bottoms-up uh, approach where you're really involving these local populations in finding solutions to their to, to these kinds of issues. Sure, I, and I, I think that's that's a lesson, a really important lesson that we learned in the process. I mean, when we started trying to figure out how to do this, we went in with. I guess you could describe this as the typical su supply side mentality of an orthodox healthcare system. We will put a service in place and then expect people come to us and take up the service that we have put there. Mm -hmm. And in order to improve and become more effective and particularly to get the people like the sex workers coming into our clinics, we realize very quick quickly that you can't just go and say this is what we think is the problem in your area. You need to actually address what they experience as the problems because preventing disease is not something that you do by just putting in a, a one-off solution. You need to build long-term relations with your key target groups. And in order to do that, you need to be talking to them about what they think is important to them and what their health considerations are. So very quickly, because of that bottom-up influx of, of data that, or of information we were getting from the communities, they were saying, you know, HIV is fine, but I've got uh, a child that needs to be inoculated. Uh, I've got uh, a problem with uh, emphysema, or I've got a problem with uh, skin rash. And so a more primary healthcare uh, approach was definitely very quickly what they were looking for. So we very quickly, I think almost in the first uh, half year, realized that, okay, we've got to position ourselves differently because you, know, you need to be working with what their concerns are. And I think you see that tendency spreading across uh, not only in our sector of the healthcare industry or the healthcare uh, field, you see it other places where we've gained a lot of knowledge about what health is. And our, we're in the middle of a paradigm shift, in my opinion, that we're moving away from this traditional or orthodox focus on top-down supply-side supply healthcare services, which say, okay, we've got hospitals here, doctors, the healthcare establishment, including the pharmaceutical industry, identifying problems and trying to plug gaps, which is moving towards working with the communities and uh, people in, in trying to figure out from their perspectives, okay, we know they're going to go through life as a cycle of health, feeling better at one point and less uh, healthy at another point. That's just how we all work. We're all in constant flux when it comes to states of health. And if you start to work with these people and help them to navigate those changes in their pattern by leveraging the assets that are closer to them as opposed to moving into uh, something you're trying to guess from a top-down perspective as to what's going to be the remedy at a given point in time, 
I think that's, that's really changing how people are, are focusing on health and what we're learning. You see a very big movement now in health as an asset. So trying to build people's capacity to leverage what's in their local communities based on the knowledge that the things that impact your health are not just contagious disease. There's been an enormous shift in disease patterns over the last hundred years where you see in the past what was killing people and, and reducing their quality of life were diseases like tuberculosis here in, in the U.S. and uh, contagious disease towards what we call the non-communicable diseases such as uh, type 2 diabetes, heart uh, disease, cancers, things like that which are influenced by a different set of factors and the vectors of transmission are not just people passing uh, pathogens between each other. They're people are being impacted by their lifestyles and where they're living. And as a result, the way to deal with that, of course, needs to change as well. So the hospitals, the idea of bringing everybody together in one place to treat them is, is really something that's changed in people's thinking. Well, if we're trying to deal with diseases that are caused by people's local circumstances and living patterns, a hospital's not really the best way to approach that, is it? So one thing that's really interesting about the way that you've actually organized to address this kind of issue and, and create this bottom-up kind of healthcare uh, solution is you've got a model that is essentially the same for all of the countries you work in, but you work in a number of very different countries, and these blue boxes still manage to create this local embeddedness with the communities. And so what's kind of the, what's the secret to actually managing um, that mix of uh, a somewhat standardized system that has clear processes and routines and uh, uh, ways of uh, measuring outcomes, but at the same time having that, that local embeddedness. I think, I think it relates back to your previous question in, in turning of, of turning your perspective upside down instead of looking at it from we're coming in to solve the health problem to a realization that there are so many different factors that influence health that you can only provide one piece of that puzzle as a healthcare provider today. It's very difficult for everybody to be good at everything, of course, in terms of healthcare provision. The person who's going to help you prevent getting HIV is not necessarily the person who's going to help you quit smoking. So in order to, if you take that mentality as I'm a piece of the puzzle, I'm part of a larger system which impacts these individuals' health, and you focus on being as good as you can at the one piece of the puzzle, so in our case, running a primary healthcare clinic in an isolated area, that's the starting point, but the more important aspect, I think, after that is opening yourself up to engaging the other pieces of the puzzle, to connecting with the government who are able to provide additional, you know, second-tier services, for example, or on the other end, to the community organizations such as youth groups or church groups who are out working with the communities. And by having a very reliable, solid anchor point for different groups to work with, um, you can really find that you can fit into many places because the basic ideas of health services and, and primary health care services are pretty standard. You know, uh, How you treat uh, a disease like HIV is, is fairly standard. Uh, there are some variations in, in treatment protocols, but that's really to do with the pharmaceutical side. But how you do that basic element is pretty good. The mentality of how to work with other people is different depending of obviously at the at the superficial level with what their requirements are but the understand underlying mentality also is fairly uniform in that you have to be open to it and that's where it starts that idea that we are one piece of the puzzle we're going to connect with these other people and help them and we're all in this together and what's i think uh, especially interesting is the fact that you're connecting a bunch of very different puzzle pieces i mean you have partners that go from uh, usaid or global uh, you know partners to to help fund uh, healthcare and development all the way down to the local dance troupe that's doing you know referrals and advocacy for your clinic how do you actually manage to you know first of all establish such a diverse group of partnership set of partnerships and then how do you actually manage to leverage them in ways that are going to improve your healthcare outcomes so I, I think the, I mean, the funny thing people ask often, I mean, how do you get a big multinational company uh, like Chevron or Heineken to work with a local dance you know, group uh, from the community is, is the, the short, the flippant short answer, I suppose, is they don't have to work together. You know, we can be there as that linking pin because they both are reliant on high quality, affordable clinical services to be able to do what they want. In the case of a multinational, it could be keeping their local workforce uh, healthy. In the case of the local community organization, it's the same thing. Their, their constituents need to be, be healthy. 
But because we're able to leverage, because we, we, we have that central linking role, they're both able to come together and in a way that they perhaps on their own would not, dealing with each other directly. Um, we just sort of fit a gap that's between there. And again, how do you do it? Um, I think one of the key things that we've done, and in, in it starts with that mentality of wanting to do it, but after that, giving your local teams enough agency in the field that they are empowered, they understand the local circumstances. They know which local community groups are going to be worth working with and which ones are perhaps not going to be as effective or, or more difficult. They know the local government uh, partners. They have to work with them on a daily basis. That's not something you can manage centrally, from, particularly not from, from the Netherlands where our head office is based, or our regional office in Nairobi for East Africa or, or Durban for Southern Africa. They can't do that. So what we've realized over the time, and we were actually caught I, I, by surprise at the extent to which our local teams, and, and we've been working with you guys to try and map this out and get a handle on it, but when you presented, you presented your first findings to us, you know, I think all of us were shocked at the vast size of the networks that we had. And I experience it when I go and visit the clinics, but truly to see, to, to map that all out, then you realize all of a sudden that your, the impact you're having as an organization is much larger than you perhaps initially anticipated. So I think a lot of times organizations see a tension between decentralization in the sense of giving people agency at the local level to execute and build those partnerships, but at the same time wanting to very, be very tight in terms of their control on key things like quality, for example, and maybe even your branding in case of commercial companies as well. But I don't see there as much inherent intention as people necessarily think there sometimes. If people know what they're supposed to be doing, and I think this is where your culture as an organization is very important. I think it's where your, your, the clarity in your mission and your vision as to what you want to achieve are very important. If those things are clear, and we train people on that, we work very intensely with our, our teams, particularly at the lower management levels, the people running the clinics, to make sure that they not only that we're giving it to them and saying this is what you should be thinking, but we've involved them in actually creating and defining those cultural keystones, our, our core values. So it really is coming from them. And then we've what we've done is just taken that, codify it, and repeat it, and make people aware of it, and constantly remind them. And if they know that, and they share that vision, it's much easier then to give them the agency to operate at a local level, because you can rest assured that they are linking that in their own minds to what you want to achieve as a group anyways. And they're, they're a fairly exceptional group of people for having led workshops with them uh, last year. Um, they're, they're really extraordinary. Um, one of the things they have to be really good at doing is kind of wearing different hats and adapting to very different kinds of partners, right? They're developing these ecosystems, but that means they have to work with public, private, nonprofit sector organizations um, and, and bring these pieces of the puzzle together. What are the kinds of implications of having to bring together organizations, partners from different sectors? Um, you were talking about organizational culture. Obviously, that's going to be very different um, in terms of the way you're going to partner and approach with a public or nonprofit or private sector uh, company? Mm -hmm. I, I think um, it, it starts with uh, a natural, that, that natural um, building on the natural culture of the company is a starting point, but it's not sufficient in itself. I think you have to go beyond, and what we try and work on in groups and our training programs is helping people to understand and identify pitfalls that they can get themselves trapped into sometimes by some people who don't, and, and particularly in certain cultural circumstances at local levels, there may be enormous moral pressure or community pressure to go in a certain direction. And to try and give them uh, the tools and uh, awareness to try and protect themselves from getting into those positions. And if they do get into those positions, how do you get yourself out? For example, if you're working with uh, local communities in, in some parts of Africa, you may have to deal with uh, the village chief headman uh, who has certain ideas of how his community should be run, which may be very much at odds with how the local uh, government authorities think that you should be delivering your healthcare services. So how does the local clinical officer balance those two things? Because those are very competing uh, edges. And now he or she, and most uh, we have a lot of females running our, our um, uh, clinics, 
will know what we want to achieve, but still sitting between those two fires is pretty intense and, and can get very uncomfortable very quickly. So what we've tried to do is build in escalation mechanisms as well, where they feel that they're under so much pressure. We try and give them, as I said, techniques are saying, right, well, don't commit yourself in this. When you enter into a conversation, be conscious of the fact that you can't go beyond this line. And if you feel yourself pressured to do that and you're in a tight situation, then we've tried to build escalation measures so they can always kick it up the management line. And then we can bring in somebody who doesn't have that local pressure. And that's really effective sometimes. It's just, you know, I'd love to help you, but my hands are tied. Oh, so you've uh, nicely exploited that bottom-up uh, uh, concept into the, the organization itself as well. I, I think, you know, every, every individual um, is used to wearing different hats. I mean, all of us, um, you know, whether it's be your professional hats or your personal life, your, your, your friends compared to your family, there's, we're all used to wearing different things. And I think instinctively, a lot of us can figure out that we're going to get into trouble sometimes. And there are conflicts we face on a daily basis. You know, do I go to my daughter's dance recital or do I go to that meeting? Mm -hmm. um, and I think recognizing that is a natural, healthy part of any management process is important. And building in enough flexibility into your system that helps people to navigate that in a way that they're going to feel comfortable with. And spending time talking about those conflicts. So one of the things at the workshop you were with uh, us in South Africa recently we did, spend time going through role-playing situations with our teams. How do you deal with this sort of thing? Getting them to share, and, and a lot of it's not us going in and teaching them what to do. A lot of it's letting them share their experiences and talking about how they solved it because, again, their local knowledge of those situations is far superior to anything that we're going to be able to put in, in many cases, uh, from an external perspective. So just by acknowledging and running them through it, giving them the opportunity to practice exchange ideas can be, you know, it's not something that's rocket science, but it's something you have to consciously recognize as being important. Mm -hmm. So these tensions, are they something you experienced yourself? You, you started out in the private sector and then moved into the nonprofit sector, um, you know, bridging those two worlds. What are the kinds of tensions that you've experienced personally in, in, from a career perspective moving from, from one sector to the other? Yeah, it's not perhaps as many as people would think. Um, I, I think sometimes people have an artificial um, division in their mind between, and it particularly revolves around the issue of discipline, that, that corporations and the private sector is by nature very disciplined, and NGOs are by nature not very disciplined, and that is complete fallacy. I mean, obviously, I think uh, if you look at the vast number of uh, private sector companies that... Uh, go under on a given year, uh, or don't make it past their third birthday, um, or if you've walked into and had an interesting customer support uh, issue, which many of us have, whether it's on, on a variety of services, then you start to uh, poke through that, that uh, veneer quite quickly. On the other hand, working with um, a lot of um, nonprofits, I've seen a level of professionality and discipline that is equal if not surpassing uh, a lot of the NGOs. The difference, of course, at the end of the day is financial reward in a lot of cases, you, you know, and that attracts perhaps different sorts of people into it. Um, you're not gonna become extremely rich in most cases working in the nonprofit sector, but increasingly a lot of people are making other choices in their lives, and that's maybe not the biggest motivation as long as you can pay your bills. But it, it's, you know, so I haven't noticed a huge difference in, 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 in that respect. What has surprised me is the amount of competition that you see in the nonprofit sector. <laughs> I, you know, coming out of the commercial world, I thought, oh, we're now all going to work together and it's going to be a better world. But again, there is you know, competition for scarce resources. And that's something I think where North Star has tried to, to do things differently and, and position ourselves as somebody who we try and work with anybody, we say, in principle. Um, and to try and really fit into that, that piece of the puzzle mentality. Um, but it doesn't completely eliminate that drive for competition at the end of the day, unfortunately. Luke, thanks a lot for sharing your experience and uh, the great work that your organization is doing. My pleasure. Thanks very much for having me.